So, hello everyone. So, as already said, my name is Daniel Seiler. I am one of the founders of Okta. And um, to give you a quick overview and background, at Okta, we're currently building an industrial content management system for training and operations and provide a smart integration to produce content without 3D models and have live sensor data integration. Basically, we optimize the interface between information and application and allow people to have the best possible ways to produce content programming free. And this results in cost efficient trainings and operational support, which is the basis for most business cases in AR. Right now, we have a rather narrow focus on AR headsets like the HoloLens 2 or, as you can see here in the picture, the Magic Leap, um, because HoloLens 2 hasn't released yet. <laughs> so, um, let's jump in. The, um, the purpose of the presentation is to share visions and nourish the fantasy. As we cannot predict the future, but shape it by developing worthy goals and working towards them. Here you see a hammer, but it's not an ordinary one. It's one that looks a little bit like Mjolnir, Thor's hammer. And the hammer, a common symbol for the tool, always carries the potential for creation and destruction at the same time. Augmented and virtual reality can be looked at from the perspective of such tool. And tools have always shaped humans as much as we've shaped them. So when asking, how will we change our thinking, we should observe and analyze the kind of tool we are creating. Ultimately, tools are always a form of optimization. Overall, new and updated tools of the last thousands of years have brought us a far way. We've typically optimized towards fewer, narrower goals and made them very efficient. And the technical, technological revolution started a long time ago. And what you see here is the productivity increase between the 60s and 2020. In the book Sapiens, uh, Yuval Noah Harari, sorry if I uh, pronounce it wrong, writes, if mankind knew what came with the agricultural revolution, it probably wouldn't have taken that step. And um, in this context, he's referring to mankind's inability to predict the consequences when only seeing the benefits. Since the agricultural revolution, we've been only accelerating our passion for optimizing optimization in order to achieve a few narrow goals despite the side effects. And I don't intend to give a negative tone to this presentation, but uh, rather a slightly positive one. Um, but even more importantly, um, an observing point of view. So we'll look at augmented and virtual reality from the perspective as a, of a tool. And um, these tools, um, yeah, as I've said. So how might AR change how we think? Let's look at, at a quick comparison for a scenario of human-to-human -human communication via a medium in between. So this is the basic model of communication. You always have a sender, a medium, and a receiver. And the medium, um, if it's a book, stored knowledge, consists of symbolic and iconographic languages and is consumed through visual senses. And um, then we we might have a uh, huge increase through um, then tons of new sensors that come with um, augmented reality head-mounted displays. For example, kinesthetic languages, spatial languages, um, visual, tactile, and oral interaction possibilities. And if we replace the book, um, the expert would now have the ability to communicate with a broader tool set of languages. And this is basically the, the essence and the, the advantage that we can build upon if we, if we work with augmented reality. In 2011, 
Kravitz et al. published a discovery about regions in our brain linked to visual processing. And this was really interesting because one of them marked the vent ventral pathway and it's responsible to decode what we see. And from the dorsal stream, three pathways support both conscious and non-conscious vi visual spatial processing, including spatial working memory, visually guided action, and navigation. And this discovery uh, raises the question whether the use of spatial interfaces might lead to a more effective interaction with technology because it activates different parts of the brain. And in comparison, there are many ways a 2D interface behaves that does not support our brain's functions to process visual input data. So this would mean that just by modifying the way where information is stored, our ventral pathway will connect synapses differently in our brains, leading to a different form of memorization. So just, let's say, by putting information into physical context, we can change the way we remember s things. So um, first image, simply consuming um, fixed stored knowledge. Second one, um, just by placing the same information in a room and then walking from one step to another um, could already have um, a different effect on how we memorize this information. And the third one would be that um, it would also be include a, an interaction at every step. And um, the assumption would be that this would have an even stronger effect on memorization. And um, for, th for this, I found a really funny example. So I like playing computer games in the evenings. Um, but I also love to listen to audiobooks. And probably most of you have started to listen to more and more audiobooks in the last years since um, uh, Audible has um, risen. Um, then, but then I started to do both at the same time. Um, and I discovered that if I only do one of the two, um, I'm actually better. So I get, if I, if I play computer, but listen and listen to an audiobook at the same time, I get worse at playing the computer. And also compared to listening um, to an audiobook solely, um, I also cannot always follow. But, uh, but doing both at the same time is actually super interesting because the result is that the performance capability to understand and remember is less than half, uh, is more than half, which means that I'm generally able to follow around 80% of, uh, of the books or even more. And um, yeah, my gaming um, performance goes down. Um, but somehow um, there, there is the ability of um, consuming both these informations and both these media at the same time. And um, the first time I realized this, I was still working as a freelance UI designer and I had very complex and long work processes. And um, I started to do this experiment. So I separated tasks, and I separated the less mentally challenging ones. And then I used to pair them with audiobooks. And the result was having a, um, a nice hourly salary while educating myself. And this was really funny. Um, so why is this important for us? It seems like some of some tasks are less immersive and therefore don't require full brain capacity. With the evidence of spatial information that helps memorization, uh, full immersion might lead to a higher brain activity. So here what you can see is one of our training products and um, the trainee in the video is learning how to operate a specific protocol to prepare, prepare an industrial gas tank for cleaning. Right now she's working just with a 3D model, but um, this is actually laid into the real um, gas tank. So the list allows, just going to repeat it once more, the, um, 
the up-to-date list allows us to have a clear instruction step visible, and she learns the right task by engaging with the indi individual part. And in the further step, um, this training um, can be hands-on. So, um, the learning activity of the trainee is categorized as a directly purposeful experience. And according to Edgar Dale, who studied the memorization effect of different learning methods in 1969 already, um, this directly purposeful experience is categorized um, or um, seems to have a 90% memorization rate. And um, I mean, this still, this should be proven now with the new technology. Like, how? Like, what is it? What are what are the difference between the study from 1969 and and now? But um, it seems to be really interesting. And um, one of the big things that changed our lives is Google Maps, which is one of the things that makes our life so much easier. And a generation before, we didn't have it, and today everyone depends on it. And before app-based navigation, we typically use paper maps. And paper maps had a very different complexity on interaction and wayfinding and required a different skill set. And comparing paper maps with Google Maps will bring us one step closer to a potential augmented reality impact. So imagine your trip to AWE Munich was from Garmisch-Partenkirchen. So those who don't know, it's somewhere in the south of the of Bavaria. And uh, yeah, because maybe you went hiking uh, before you came here. If you would now have to memorize, yep, memorize the text directions only by looking at them once, you would have a certain mental effort to do this. But if you would take the same route multiple times, this effort would eventually go down as you start to remember what to do. You just get used to it. An easier way would be to get to AWE Munich from the airport by using your car, because it's only three waypoints that you have to remember. And this route would have a faster learning curve. So the mental effort required to remember and execute would lower much faster. Now, Google Maps joins the game. And what it does is it reduces the mental effort no matter how complicated a route. And the super awesome and immediately adopted by everyone who has never before driven a route ahead. So, but here's the effect. By not repeatedly training the method of reading text instructions and remembering them, the ability to do so slowly decreases, <clears throat> shifting all the curves up and decreasing the general capability of the method. So I don't know if this is good or bad because we don't depend on paper maps anymore. So um, maybe we can just move on and use Google Maps for the rest of our lives, as long as we have internet. Um, yeah. So, when a groundbreaking technology like GPS navigation is enabled, it has a significant effect to its preceding method. The low-brainer map navigation system would have this green chunk of mental effort saved every time a task is performed. And... Whoop, yeah, the green chunk of mental energy is the key to the revolution of knowledge work. Because automation of physical efforts is not a big issue anymore. In today's challenges of industrial productivity, any task and method with a reduced mental effort results in its knowledge workers to produce more. This leads to more time. To, uh, this leads to ti uh, more time to produce more, further pushing the productivity, or we just can have more time to procrastinate. Everyone's open to do um, with this whatever he or she wants to. So, um, personally, I've reached two conclusions here, and um, there are a couple of examples I'm going to show during these presentations, and on the conclusion side, I would really like to involve you in ask you about your opinion about this specific scenario, what you think might be the conclusion here. So 
these two conclusions would be that every paper map interaction decreases the effort for the next map usage, and every map navigation interaction is a missed opportunity of an exercise for irregular map usage and increases the gap to map. Um, so the audience, what is your opinion on this conclusion as Daniel asks you to engage a little? Any ideas? Because this is just one, um, one opinion of it. <laughs> There's one back there. There's somebody. I can maybe pose a little counter question, because what about if you look it up on a digital map, but before driving? Because that's what I usually do, to look if there's any traffic jams or something like that. But then I don't use the map while I'm driving live. Yeah. Um, um, I, I assume that you probably have developed already. You, you might be already um, very far on the blue one because you did your route a couple of times. And actually, here, visually, it's already, it's, it's also below the Google Maps um, border, what Google Maps provides you. Um, when I thought about this, I was also thinking that it might be possible that um, just by remembering everything, and you and knowing really well um, your your main routes between home and office, for example, you would even have a decreased mental effort than just by using Google Maps. Could be here. I think the key to most of these dichotomies is. I think the, the key to most of these dichotomies is what actually you do with the saved mental effort. If you are going to use that mental effort in creative exercises and think new ideas and, yeah. and try to solve problems, then it's definitely good that you don't have to spend time figuring out how to read a map. But if you're going to use that time to watch uh, influencers in YouTube videos, th totally. then maybe it would have been best if you had spent a little time to, to exercise your, your brain muscles. Right, yeah, totally. And also... Um, one of the uh, influencers in Silicon Valley, Mark Andreessen, he said software is eating the world, but if um, everyone's focused on consuming internet, it's actually much more like the world is consuming software and, and eating software all the time. So that's exactly like if you, if you, if you um, have all these new um, chunks of free energy, mental energy, then it could all be... Um, wasted on on activity um there's one more question here near question thanks uh what about if i usually try to uh try to look at the street view before my trip and then remember like key features or key buildings and i don't use maps because i I prepare my brain to uh, to remember the the street view, and how how my brain works if compared to following just following the. the yeah, um, I think what you would have to do, Dennis, just um, gather all the different kinds of methods because you have your personal method, he has his personal method, and those are all usually methods that are used by a lot of users because Google Maps basically used by everyone, and then those specific methods should be compared against each other and just be seen um, like and, and observed like where, where are the specific differences. There's, There's somebody very perseverant. Yeah. I'm jumping there. Poor man. Like. Uh, yeah, so just to give an example of what you're talking about, um, a couple of years ago, went on holidays and we were using uh, Google Maps. And uh, normally, uh, I would have used paper maps. What I found was that I was not actually remembering the route anymore. I was depending on the maps to get me from A to B. Hmm. So like that, it actually, you know, so it, it decreased my ability to do that. Yeah. Um, so like if I was just literally left without the map, uh, it would take much, much longer to find out where I was actually meant to be going. Whereas in, uh, normally, 
they pick that up after uh, after a couple of journeys. And I'm just wondering if you apply that to a work situation where people are now depending on on say augmented reality to to do their action. You know, is that basically an overall decrease in performance generally? Well, yeah, that's 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 super super interesting, and it had always has to be be kept in in mind when you when you start to do training support through augmented reality because it if you don't apply the right didactic methodologies then it could lead to a dependency where people are more productive and they do their work faster and there's a reduced mental effort but they don't actually remember stuff and that's um that's quite challenging um maybe the next examples um this will be a bit more revealing so let's just move on so, um, a world where consumers wear augmented reality glasses on the street and at home, preferably over mobile phones. So, imagine this might happen some, some time in the year. And there's this thing called the Google syndrome. Um, the prevailing attitude toward literature, science, and history appears to be, if I can Google it, I don't need to build a foundation of knowledge. So what's happening here is that people say, um, for me, it's more, uh, it's, it's more easy if I know where I can find knowledge and information than what the actual content of the information is. And um, for this, um, I thought of this example of a, just a user flow of having your mobile phone with you and doing everything that's necessary to get a result uh, when Googling something. So pull out the phone, unlock, Chrome app, Google search, type, enter, way to load, scan result page, tap, way to see result, read result. The X axis is the time. And this is slightly different with every phone and user and um, the way you do things. But now imagine audio interfaces. Um, the same activity, if it's possible to search, um, through an audio interface would be by pulling out the phone, unlocking, activate the, activating the phone, asking the questions, waiting, and getting the voice answer. So here you already have a reduction in time. And now imagine everyone wears glasses on their heads all the time, and they can use a voice interface. So now it would be activate voice, wait, and get a voice answer. And so all of a sudden we have these new chunks of time that can be used for certain things or um, whatnot. So imagine back in the days, you would want to look up a short summary of the history of China. Your local library has the book. So you go there, search for the book, open it, read it, and then you know. Because of your efforts to achieve such information, you would have to be very engaged to remember this information in anticipation of the effort it takes trying to look it up once more. Now, and um, the memorization effort would be really high. Now with the mobile phone, boom, all of a sudden, the time to retrieve information decreases rapidly and an inner, inner lever gets pulled to preferably choose not to remember because Google is available at all times. And um, so my personal thoughts would be that there seems to be an invisible barrier that decides whether you, tr whether you, whether you actually remember something and when you look something up. And... Um, I'm also not quite sure if we're doing this consciously. It's probably an unconscious uh, mechanism. And there is this unconscious monkey we all, f all have in, in, inside of ourselves. And I think he's trying to get the smallest surface of the combination of the, the X and Y axis and just tries to find what's the actual sweet spot. So if we subconsciously know it's really hard trying to retrieve an information, we're probably going to remember it. And if we know it's super, super easy to, to retrieve an information, we're probably not going to remember it. So a tablet with a password of 57 letters is probably more on the right side. And um, general uh, te technology in general 
is probably pushing more towards the left side and making things easier and better and more accessible and connecting people and th all these kinds of things. So um, the conclusion that I came up here was that time to information decrease through improved technology, technological capability and interaction will lead to decreased memorization activities. What are your thoughts on this? Here, here's one. So I totally agree with your conclusion, and I don't think it's a problem. Um, I used to memorize everything. It was I had kind of like this hyper vigilant memory. I would remember conversations books, and then I read Richard Feynman's memoirs where he tells a story about how um, he was teaching a biology class and his realm was physics. And he looked up a book, in a book, a diagram of a cat's intestines to draw it on the board. Mm -hmm. And all the students made fun of him because they all had to memorize that years ago. So they just knew it. And he said, no, it's a lot more important to just know how to find the information than to just have it memorized and, and use all of that activity up by your brain. So I think it's a good thing. Hi, um, I've got a sort of comment from the previous um, one as well. Oh, I'm, okay, a, sure. I'm a psychologist from University of Glasgow. Oh, wow. Um, so I think it would be interesting to chat after because there's a lot of empirical research that I think will back up what you're saying. Yep. In the previous one, I was thinking about the spatial navigation and spatial memory. There's a lot of work being done on different personality types yep. and how people navigate uh, with the um, physical maps and then the digital interaction, what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And with the memory and this, like yourself said, there's different types of um, the way people memorize things and how they interact with the information. So I was just wondering how much empirical work you looked at and uh, if you looked at any sort of uh, university work that people are doing, academic work. And it would be interesting to talk more because I, <laughs> I think there's a lot of empirical research that I know of that you might be interested in looking at. Yeah, definitely. Um, if I, um, this might only take a couple of seconds, but um, there's, there are, there, there was one work Okay, I, uh, here. Um, Howard Gardner, Jeremy Bruner, and Kieran Egan. Those were three works. They they were um, studying on how people think and the dif different languages of thought. Those were some some very interesting um, um, essays and papers I looked at. But yeah, let's discuss this later, maybe. Thank you. Hi, Daniel. One more question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was certainly I was interested in the empirical evidence as well, but I was curious that as uh, we reduce the need to memorize, does it affect everything else? Um, is the effect across the board like anything we try to memorize? Are we are we losing the muscle to memorize? I'm just curious to know if there's any evidence of that, or are we just making space to memorize things we want to? Um, I don't know. I'm I'm sorry. Like I'm, I've I've looked at looked at these topics, but um, I think we have experts here, like um, <laughs> her, <laughs> and that where we should um, where we should um, rely upon. <laughs> any answer to that question? Maybe someone knows. Um, we switched from memorizing everything to books uh, in the past, and we haven't lost anything by far. And anyways, evolution works in a very, very long periods of time, so I don't think we will lose any muscles by... <laughs> no, no, it's not like this. That's a good point, yeah. Another answer? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I just feel like I have a lot of... Uh, knowledge about that. It, it's just, I think it's changing the way we're learning. So it seems like we're relying more on the working memory rather than retaining everything in the long-term memory like we used to, mm. which I think whether it's good or bad, I think there's still debates going on, at least among the academics. But I think it's just a different way of learning. 
I, my personal opinion, I think it's better that we're using working memory because that means we can pro solve problems faster. Oh. And I think that's why I've noticed, at least with the younger kids, um, not that I'm not <laughs> very old, but I think you can see the, the transition of how they find information faster and how they navigate um, through the different types of information and adapt to new technology faster. So there's benefit to that, um, but I'm sure there are negatives as well. It's just a different way of, of learning, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I also agree. Probably it's just different and not better and worse, but for some use cases worse and for some it's better. Um, the next idea uh, we, we, we came up with and discovered was that, um, so we had conversations where one of the participants was using AR headwear. And um, we noticed that compared to mobile screens, AR displays are more private because you cannot really see what the AR wearable user is currently seeing. So this photo here shows you, okay, there's something you might see, but it's really not that much. And this allows the users to keep content consumption more from the, for, for, for themselves. So the thought here would be that a change of mobile hardware to wearable hardware, our behavior to consume things, we probably feel more confident um, to consume things that we would otherwise only do at home. So the assumption and idea here was, is that there is a privacy, privacy increase through augmented reality head mounted displays and probably the, the what you do with technology in public and what you do with technology at home might be coming closer together. Um, what are your thoughts on this? I have one here. I think this started already with the, uh, with the smartphone. Uh, so you have your privacy with your and, you, and, you, and nobody's looking into your smartphone actually when you're in the, in the in the metro. So I think it started already. Will be enhanced, but it started already. Um, sure. The thing is here compared uh, between wearable and smartphone. Smartphone still shows your screen to other people. You can you can um, do th um, have um, procedures and try to hide it, um, but it's. It's not the same. I think it will be more amplified with AR wearables. I think that the the problem with privacy is not what the guy besides me on the bus may, on, may be looking at. I think it's all the things that are being tracked on the devices. That's mm -hmm. what worries me. And it's not going to change with headsets. They're going to be tracking maybe even more because they're tracking even the position of my head. Yeah. So and your eyes where, and you're how, where my eyes are, whack, are looking. So AR headsets are not going to change that. I think they're going to make the privacy problem more. That's yeah, I agree. There's one over here. Yeah, no, I think it's a very interesting question because, uh, like, uh, it, it, if that's the case, then what's socially acceptable will change. Because, I mean, there has been, uh, uh, like, uh, cases where people have complained about people looking up obscene content on the, on the metro, mm. you know. And so that could be happening without you knowing it. And what does that do in terms of what's acceptable, what's not acceptable in society? So I think, actually, that's, that's actually, this is actually could be a huge issue. Yeah. The ideas we had is that maybe some people have very strong political opinions that are really radical, so you would never show them in public, but now they can um, connect to their channels much more easily without anyone knowing, as an example. Yeah, about, thanks for your ideas about the stuff that people are not not looking to another's phone screens like I'm disagree because if if I want or not I always see a screens 
of uh, people around me. Yeah. And if I'm really like not focusing, I still even can read a messages from there. So yeah. it's like unprivate. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But for me, the problem of privacy is a history of search that is saving in my browser. That, for example, I can uh, search for something in on my way to my work, and then when I open up my laptop, my Chrome browser will sh will show this small screen spree preview of a stuff what I've saw, mm -hmm. and like people who is sit sit sitting close to me can see it. Yeah. And also the biggest uh, problem is with the YouTube, when I'm watching a one sor sort of a videos and then I open a YouTube on my working space, it shows me a similar video that I saw before, so people can also see it. And it's, I guess, it's a problem. Yeah. Totally, I totally agree. Also, I know in, in in airplanes there are usually people using their phones all the time, but everyone can always see what the other one is doing in front of them. Yeah, <laughs> if you if you want to uh, look at these screens, it's possible, definitely. And also, imagine you uh, you finish a YouTube. I had this already during during presentation. Um, showed a YouTube video, it finished, and then it recommended me like, hey, <laughs> here are new documentaries about this and this stuff, and everyone knew. Okay, this guy's interested in. Um, American politics, <laughs> and um, it's that's something these screens have as as a side effect. Yeah. Um, one of the next ideas would be that at the moment, if we have a personal conversation in a room, we see each other, and then we talk to each other. And these guys, <laughs> everyone knows them. Now imagine one or both of the participants has a wearable on their head. What would be the difference? And um, here we came up with so many ideas that I'm not even, I'm, I'll, I'll only give um, one example. And one thing that, that we noticed is that there are, you require, like um, at the moment, um, if you have full, um, exposure to a face of someone, you're really confident in analyzing the emotion. And if the if this partition is blocked because of a an AR wearable, like a dark like dark sunglasses, for example, you're not as um, there there might be uh, be misinterpretations of emotions. And body emotions are quite essential to face to face communication. So this might lead to tendentially higher misunderstandings. That was one of the ideas. Um, yeah, but at the same time, we will probably also see lots of opportunities to enhance communication by context-based information um, in the way of being on the same page. So imagine both of the communicators have wearables and they have this free space in front of each other and they're talking about something and they're able to use 3D visualizations or whatever holographic imagery to enhance their discussion. This might also open a new way of communicating with each other. Um, any ideas? Sorry, that's me again. <laughs> um, I think it probably depends on the content of what they're talking about, because yeah. um, there's obviously faces inevitably, and eyes in particular is the telltale. It's a very uh, strong social cue. But yeah. if they are working on some sort of project together, say, perhaps the social cue of what other person thinks of you is not as important as if it's a sort of social interaction mm. and um, sort of building of the relationship. And I thought it, because um, my specialty is uh, research in autism, so um, actually having the blocked eyes perhaps would be beneficial for someone who is very bad at social communication because oh. um, autistic okay. people tend to pay attention more to the mouth um, and it's sort of this area rather than the eyes because they tend to avoid the eye contact. So for them, that would be an easier way of communication rather than for somebody who's relying on the social strong cue of uh, eye contact and what eyes tell. That's it's really interesting. Wow, yeah. 
Any other questions? In the back. Uh, not so much a question, but uh, come across uh, something one of my partners is doing with uh, autism, where they're using uh, head-mounted displays, in this case HoloLens, to help integrate autistic kids and get them uh, used to the environment, but also using AI to do um, emotion recognition to help them understand emotions. Uh, just an interesting application in that space. Oh, cool. And the uh, emotional recognition, is it through the video stream and then um, neural networks? Yeah, fa that, yeah, using AI uh, for uh, sentiment analysis and facial recognition oh, okay. to then give them cues on what to look for. Wow. That's really interesting. There's one more. Um, I think it's more like a temporary problem because uh, best case future scenario would be that the AR headsets are more like normal glasses. So, of course, we can see the eyes through them. Yeah, that so would it wouldn't, be, won't be a problem yeah. in the future, hopefully. Would be the best case, true. Current um, transparent displays only emit light, however, and the only way they solve it at the moment is by putting dark particles into the glass and then emitting light so that you at least have a good average vision. I think bigger problem or annoyance will be, it already is, a lot of people are speaking to you and then they look at their mobile phone and get busy there. At least you know in this interface that they are not listening to you. But with these HMDs, probably you keep on talking to someone and he's just somewhere else doing something and they're like, oh, what exactly? Yeah, is totally. So That's something we also noticed that you never know if someone is actually physically present. Uh, mentally present. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the next scenarios would be that, so in the past we had computers, then laptops arrived, uh, mobile phones arrived, we changed our workspace to stationary and mobile. Some in this world are only dependent on mobile phones. For example, in China, there's a huge user base of people who, who manage their whole lives only through a mobile phone. It's particu particularly also because of the price of a mobile phone compared to a laptop. And now imagine in the next generation there will be mobile phones, um, wearables, also laptops. But now imagine the scenario really far in the future where we only have wearables when we're outside and there are supermarkets where you can only enter and have a shopping experience if you have your wearable on your head because otherwise the system just wouldn't work. What would happen here? And one of the... I found something from Keiji Matsuda. It's called um, Hyper Reality and he did some really great visionary video projects on this and showing future scenarios where AR is completely, completely integrated into personal life. And here it shows a scene in a supermarket where AR wearables are mandatory in society. And the overlaid information shows lots of advertisement and intended manipulation. And um, what, what we assumed is that we might become like the moment we are not able to opt out anymore to the um, to our the immediate information that is displayed through our wearables in your immediate environment unless taking them off but then you cannot do a shopping experience anymore that that really allows advertisement and um, information manipulation to just uh, take it on another level any any thoughts and ideas about this topic there's one over here Hi, um, this is quite interesting because we were 
actually discussing this video yesterday. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I'm, well, at, back at Coventry University, this video is being shown in my class today um, about a dystopian future for augmented reality. Mm -hmm. um, what I think is the larger sort of social impact, it's potentially going to create a divide in society between the haves and the have-nots of, uh, of these technologies. Because I think about a minute after this screenshot's taken, the lady gets hacked, um, and then you see the world without the augmented reality display, and it's a, a barren world of QR markers and no real information. Yeah. So I think, although this is inevitably where we're going with the AR cloud and, wear, and wearable technology, it definitely creates a big social concern for people who are unable to access the technology. So that, that's kind of my biggest takeaway from, from these areas. Mm. And also what it's going to do as far as the cognitive load on the amount of information that you're taking in at any one time, which I think is very interesting um, thought exercise when it comes to these things. Yeah, totally. I recommend everyone to Google hyper-reality and watch the videos. They really have a dystopian storyline to them. Um, Any other thoughts, ideas, questions? There's one. Hi, thanks your, uh, for your ideas. Uh, um, it's not just a question, but uh, just a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, what you are presenting is, uh, in a certain sense, similar to what uh, I'm currently studying. Cool. What I yeah. think is that uh, I'm more on the interaction part and on the study of uh, how we perceive the world. Yeah. What I think is that uh, maybe we have to stress uh, on the interplay between the studies uh, on uh, how we perceive the real world and try to understand uh, if uh, something is different when we perceive uh, a virtual or an augmented reality scenarios. Mm. So we have uh, to understand and uh, to use the knowledge about uh, what we know about uh, interaction and perception in the real environments, so the studies that, that maybe psychologists are uh, doing, and uh, use uh, this knowledge in order to uh, to take the best from augmented reality. So augmented reality is uh, going to, to propose to us a, a huge number of possibilities, but maybe we have to take care of not uh, stressing our perceptual system too much. So we have to take, to take care of the fact that, that we have a perceptual system, our perceptual system is working, and uh, we have to, to be compliant with, uh, what, we, with uh, um, what nature has given to us. So the, the, the strategies, the techniques, the, techniques, uh, the uh, solutions that uh, we use uh, to interact uh, in the real world and to perceive the real world uh, and uh, to translate uh, such kind of uh, modalities also into uh, augmented reality. I think that uh, it applies for uh, interaction, but uh, as well also to uh, the cognitive load uh, for example, this example is uh, a, an extreme example, but uh, also more simple uh, uh, scenarios uh, could uh, g give us the, the same problem. It's yeah. just my, my, my thought. And uh, of course, uh, maybe also the contrary is good. So we can uh, use uh, uh, the, what we know about interacting, interacting in such kind of scenarios in order to, to have an additional knowledge about uh, our system works. And uh, mm -hmm. so my idea. Yeah, definitely. It's a lot, a lot. <laughs> I have to process right now. Hi, um, this is more, uh, there is a lot of psychology aspects in it, but this yeah. is more just my personal opinion. I think um, I agree with the cognitive load, and I think that's, there's more and more research coming out in psychology on that. But I think uh, this is just why I think, um, because the technology, although it's uh, moving so fast and is exciting, it is still breakable and things can happen. So it's just my personal test is, if, let's say, something happens and all of this convenient information is taken away, um, w would we be able still to do and survive? That would be my question. I think the idea behind the AR and all new technologies has to make life easier. But if it goes away, is it still possible to do it? And I think in a scenario like this would be difficult to shop if 
if you didn't have an AR. So I think for me, it would be just for any new technologies, the test, if you take it away, it might take longer and take away the convenience, but it's still possible to go ahead and, and do what you normally do. But if it's not possible, I think then that causes a problem in the society yeah. and in everyday functioning. And it's just my personal opinion. I think that should be the sort of baseline test for any new technology. Yeah, like what happens if you cannot use it anymore. But um, technologi technological progress has had a significant impact on our average life expectancy through all these innovations in healthcare and whatnot. At the same time, um, I think we're also specializing on a whole other level, like life in its complexity is probably increasing. That's, yeah. And um, as an, as, a, as another conclusion to the hyper-reality video is that we might be able to think of augmented reality as a substitutive reality. So what it means is that the moment you add new information into your screen, you're hiding the reality behind that. So you cannot really, like, you can add things, but the moment you add something, you also remove what's behind that because you cannot see this anymore. And um, I like to think of this as using headphones. Um, everyone loves headphones, especially noise canceling. And they cancel the environmental sounds to add music to it and removing the aerial sounds of reality and adding the virtual sound. And then the result is that we have the effect of the headphones. But they do hide what um, like all the noises around us. Um, any ideas about substitutive reality? small one. Um, then also in this supermarket, the moment, the moment you're only dependent on AR glasses and they stop working, you're left in a place where there, where products only consist of barcodes and don't have any product packaging design. And um, it seems like a uh, toaster like this would could happen could be a product of the future where you don't have any mechanical buttons to interact with. It only has the part where you put the toast in, and then everything else you control over over your glasses. And um, this could lead to a new trend in design where you cannot really see the purpose of certain objects. Maybe they can have a complex, complex functionality, but without the combination of a, of a wearable, you would never be able to do anything with them and understand what they can do. Any questions or ideas or thoughts about this potential change in, in um, designing products? Dear, dear, dear. <laughs> 